time to uh, talk and get to know each other. I saw a lot of great conversations going on throughout the room. So that's a good thing. Get to know a lot of good people in the same field, the same passion. Our speakers will have our seat pretty soon. We'll start in a minute. As we begin our third panel, this panel will be talking about charter schools versus uh, traditional public schools. Uh, our first, uh, the, the panel will be led by three folks, uh, Mrs. Uh, Erika Gonzalez, Mr. Seth Bramble, and Dr. Patricia Birch. Uh, our first panel speaker is Dr. Patricia Birch, uh, who is an associate professor for the USC Rossier School of Education. She was appointed to assistant professor in the Department of Education Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the fall of 2003. Dr. Birch received her BA in English from Oberlin College in 1985 and her MA in Education from Harvard University in 1991, her MA in Sociology from Stanford University in 1998, and her PhD in Education from Stanford University in 2000. Please help me welcome Dr. Birch, Patricia Birch. Okay. Oh, then you might have a PowerPoint here then. Uh, glasses, yeah. What an honor to uh, be at this very important event. Um, and I heard that, uh, I was sorry I couldn't be at this morning's sessions, but um, very interested in following up. I heard there's heard in the hallways there was some very interesting conversation going on. Um, I know you want to get to the, the juice and the Q&A, so just tell me how to get to my PowerPoint and I'll get that. Right here. Uh-uh. Nope. There. So, um, just, a, just a few minutes ago, is it Seth who's talking to some of the co-panelists, and he said, are you, are you the one who's, who's going to be talking about the research, all that boring academic stuff, <laughs> or something like that, and uh, paraphrase, and uh, yeah, so not, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna try not to make it boring, but my charge here uh, today was to put uh, the the issue of charter schools in its broader context um, before we hear about uh, the, the real live issues happening on the ground from, from Seth and from um, Erica. Um, one of the things that you should know about me, uh, I'm a, again, I'm a professor of, uh, at the University of Southern California. I've been um, involved in education reform for lots and lots of years as a parent, as a policymaker, working for a school board. At, uh, now as a researcher. Um, the other thing you should know about me is that I had a birthday on Saturday, uh, but don't ask um, how old I am. Um, but what, um, one of the things that you, is good about getting older, I think you'd agree, those of you who are in my age range, is that you realize that there's nothing new under the sun, but there's lots of old things um, that we don't know. And that's a quote from Ambrose Spears, who's an author of a book called The Devil's Dictionary. But this idea seems to apply to a lot of education policy and also to charter schools. Um, so each, each reform idea, where, whether it's merit pay, where it's the portfolio management model, public choice, charter schools, what have you, seems to excite us. Um, and we say, aha, you know, I think this is the answer uh, to reducing the achievement gap, and it may be. And I think we are crawling closer to some important answers in public education, not fast enough, of course. Um, but I think that the way that we have to do that is in part on building on what we've learned and actually looking at the facts and the figures on what's, on what's happening. And that's what I'm going to try and do for the next few minutes um, around the charter schools uh, model. 
some of, and, and again, this I'm going to whip through quite a bit of this because I have a feeling that uh, um, my indicator is whether you're looking at your Blackberries, whether this is new or not, or your iPhones. Um, but uh, you should. It's important to know the the um, that the basic principle, of course, behind charter schools is that they are uh, they are public schools, right? So this this panel was titled charter schools versus traditional public schools, and in some ways, you know, do we want to set up that kind of dichotomy? Uh, charter schools are public schools, exempt from many state and local regulations, no tuition paid with tax dollars, accountable. The idea here, we think about outcome, Seth, idea, the idea is to introduce, in principle, to introduce competi competition to the traditional public schools and uh, create innovation and efficiency. And so the, these two key principles of charter schools, autonomy in principle, more on t autonomy than regular public schools to make uh, decisions concerning organizational structure, curriculum, um, and in return, accountability for the academic achievement of school uh, students and, and, and uh, performance standards that are set. Um, so let's just, again, just to look at this as a, as a trend, um, it, it's, it, charter schools is, is not a new idea, it's been, you know, mid-90s or so, it's definitely here and happening. If you look at this, this is a snapshot from, I think, the um, National Center for Education Statistics, more than doubled since um, 2000 um, in the number of charter schools, so they're, they're with us. Um, now let's look at uh, California in relationship to um, the other states. Um, again, the number of charter schools and the issues facing charter schools really vary a lot by, by state, but you'll see, again, this is data for 2009, 98 new charters, a total of 313, maybe 315,000 charter school students in 2009 and 10. Um, about one third, a little less, a little more than the total number of, of charter school students nationwide. You can ask questions as you as you go, as you're compelled, or or wait till the end. Um, big issue here is um, is the issue of state caps. The number of charter school is based a lot on state law that could cap the number of charters available. Um, authorizers, which in California are LEAs and SEAs, in other states can be municipalities, universities, are still very important gatekeepers. They're responsible for making sure, you know, whether first accepting the application, whether there's the finance and the capacity. And then the, the third big issue, of course, as we know, is the race to the top money. And a charter school uh, issue is not a local issue, nor it's a national issue. So. Obama and Arne Duncan have tied uh, federal funding to, um, to charter schools and requested that states lift charter school caps as a condition of receiving federal funding. So certainly on the, um, the national plate. You know, I forgot my, my watch. Um, am I doing OK? OK. Um, Seth's going to talk about unions. <laughs> All right, um, but, but uh, what I'd like to do is just briefly highlight some of the flashpoints, is not the, but the live issues that we need to really pay attention to when we're thinking about this in California. Uh, most charter school teachers are not unionized. What does that mean? Uh, possibly longer school days, faster firing practices, more experiments with merit pay. Changes here, I think, that Erica will talk to. Yes, yeah, some teachers joining unions. Um, the issue of autonomy, can a charter school maintain autonomy if teachers are part of a union? Can it maintain autonomy if it's not a part of a union and, and run by, say, an educational management organization? The issue of capacity, we've got lots of mom and pops out there. Um, a lot, and also then we have on the other end of the continuum a few uh, uh, networks of charter schools that are growing nationally. How do we think about or if we believe in this idea, where we see effects, how, how do we think about building local capacity to continue growth in the movement or to strengthen the movement grounded in the issues we care about, like uh, citizenship? Um, it's just some data here. Teachers in tar charter schools tend to be less experienced, more likely to have emergency credentials, and a high 
um, turnover rate. Charter school governance, just so you know, these are orga um, organizations formed to manage charter schools, to sort of marry the benefits, if you will, of districts, similar schools, uh, uh, economies of scale with the idea of an organization that's going to uh, promote uh, innovation and flexibility outside of the bureaucracy. Um, two kinds of, of, of governance organizations. Funding is a huge issue, you know this. So um, it's a huge issue for us right now in general. Um, uh, scary. I mean, it is the issue on the, on the education plate is the state of funding um, in California for public schools. Um, in the context of that debate, the, the issue of how much funding charter schools are, are getting is, is key. Um, charter school uh, proponents will say that they uh, are at a disadvantage financially, uh, a lower amount of, of per pupil expenditures, and dependent on external money quite a bit. Let's take a look at LA. So about $1,200 less than non-charters per pupil revenue. And you, you know, when you look at that in terms of a, of, you multiply that when you're talking a bigger school, that, that adds up. Big issues around, and people have said proponents and uh, opponents of charter schools have focused on the issue of who are these schools serving? Do charter schools encourage or discourage racial, ethnic, or uh, segregation by uh, income? Interesting to think about this also in the context of California, a number of, and nationally, a number of schools starting that are geographically focused, pulling a particular demographic or mission driven based on eth eth ethnic identity. Um, is this good or bad? I'm not gonna tackle that here, but we need to think about this. Um, why or, or why not? But let's zoom in and look a little bit at, at socioeconomic data in LAUSD for 2005 and six. This is a little bit dated here. Um, but one of the things that you'll see here is there's not, there's really not any significant difference in a percentage of kids in poverty being served in, in charter schools versus non-charter schools. And that's weighted, so it doesn't look very different there. So who do charter schools serve? This, again, a national uh, snapshot. It varies by state, again, due to those state laws. Some highlights from this slide in California, um, mirroring LAUSD, the percent of low-income students in charters and regular public schools are about the same. Um, higher percent of, of black students in traditional public schools, higher percentage of white students, lower percentage of Hispanic and Asian students, varies by level. Uh, so it's a, it's a, there are some trends nationally, varies by state um, uh, in terms of ethnic identity. Now, are charter schools successful? This is the, the, the question, right? This is the, is this the question the, the, that everybody one minute left, that is the, that is the answer to that question. Uh, um, and this is important, so let me just, uh, the, what, uh, are charter schools successful? What do you think? I'm just curious. You guys know, you're out there. I hate it when it's like yes and no, because it really, it, it absolutely makes me doubt my decision to move into research and academia, but that, but, but it is, it's true, is on, on average, they perform no better or worse than traditional public schools with respect to student achievement in math and ELA. Um, and there is some evidence, again, flip, flipping through this, um, there's some evidence that specific populations fare better in charter schools, low-income, previous low-performing students. There's some evidence that charter schools with specific characteristics perform better than others. And this is where the funders are flocking. Urban, high percent of low-income, low-achieving students. No evidence in the basic principle that I talked about earlier um, in, in the idea of charter schools, that seeing that, that the presence of charter schools is triggering changes in, in the rest of the school system, whatever we want from that. Um, lots of reasons why they haven't been successful or not, and we're not going to talk about those because we had a, a minute left. Um, back to Ambrose Beers, nothing new under the sun, lots of things we don't know. Absolutely, charter schools are at a crossroads. We need to start seeing more evidence of effects, however one wants to define that broadly or narrowly, 
at scale and we need to address the funding issue if we're going to move forward um, with this reform. Otherwise, it, it should pass. And here's my contact information uh, for um, uh, other work that I'm doing in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Birch. I would also now like to bring down Ms. Erica Gonzalez, who is the Director of Public Affairs and Community Partnership for Green Dot Public Schools. She is responsible for Green Dot's education reform advocacy efforts, connecting students and families uh, to needed community services and ensuring compliance with governing laws and regulations for charter schools. Ms. Gonzalez earned her BA in Political Science from the University of California at Berkeley and Master's of Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Ms. Gonzalez. Good afternoon, everybody. As my colleague, uh, Dr. Birch mentioned, there is, the panel name is, is a little controversial, uh, Charters versus Traditional schools, it's actually, we're not in comfort. Well, we are all trying to do the same thing, which is get our kids a good education. And so I think that is a better way to frame the conversation. Um, and I'm, I would like to start with just giving broader California details, and then I'll go specific into Green Dot, who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. So what is a charter school? Charter schools are public schools of choice. Parents choose to send their, their students to a charter school. We serve all students. Um, they have open enrollment. They're tuition free, so they, they're free, just like a traditional public school. Uh, they usually tend to be managed by local educators, teachers, administrators, or on-site um, normally from that community or care deeply about the community that they're serving. They are also independent, so we are a 501c3. That means our, all our decisions are governed at the local level and through our larger governing board. And we have a, a strong influence um, and <coughs> excuse me, emphasis on parent involvement and participation. Just to get you a, a picture of what it looks like in California, California has, uh, for 2010-2011, has about a 912 charter schools, which is the largest concentration in the whole nation. Um, growth has been consistent over the past 10 years. Um, and last, uh, right now, what we're looking at is 86% of charters are new startups. So those are that are starting from a current grade and starting over, whereas conversions are existing schools that tend to will want to convert to a charter. So those are teacher-led um, petitions. A lot of them are in partnership with their, with their district. Um, what the real telling picture here is what you can see is um, Los Angeles has the highest concentration. There's 273 charter schools total in LA, but 192 of them are found in LAUSD. And last year alone, 36 new charter schools um, opened up. And you can see um, similar patterns throughout the state, but again, the largest focus. Um, where you see the, the kind of largest concentration in growth in charter schools is um, where communities or parents feel that their traditional school district is not serving their needs. Um, so Green Dot, a little bit about Green Dot. Green Dot is unique. We are a CMO, which is a charter management organization, and our mission is to prepare students for college leadership in life, but also to transform public education for Los Angeles and beyond. Um, what that means is that Green Dot um, performs kind of on the same public dollar, so we get the same uh, per pupil funding, actually a little bit lower in California, and we are actually fully unionized, which makes us different from most charters. So we are represented by CTA, both our teachers and our classified staff. Uh, the reason for that is we want to have an apple to apples comparison. You know, a lot of people like to kind of throw um, traditional districts under the bus and they blame a variety of reasons as to why things are failing or students aren't succeeding or why teachers aren't successful. So for Green Dot, it was really important to make sure that we were dealing with similar, uh, similar challenges or similar constraints that a traditional district deals with. So we are unionized, as mentioned. Our student population mir mirrors that of the district. Um, I'll show more details about that in, in a minute. And we also have the same spending levels as, as our comparison district. Um, our strategy or our mission, which makes us very controversial, is that we're all about pushing uh, reform, broader reform and district re reform specifically. Um, LAUSD is currently serving about 700,000 students. So that's a, that's a large, there's a large amount. There's a lot of work to be done. And so Green Dot is really about how do we push the district to be able to do better for all kids? Because we can't open up thousands of schools. We shouldn't. There's plenty of good educators. And how do we kind of work together to be able to make sure that all kids are getting a quality education? 
with that in mind, Green Dot has kind of changed its strategy in more recent years to school transformations. So school transformations are different from independent uh, charter schools in that you're taking over an existing uh, low-performing school. So uh, for in our case, it has been at LUSD. Our first one was locked in 2008. This past year, through the Public School Choice Initiative, uh, we are opening up two um, independent charter middle schools at the former Henry Clay campus aimed at this issue. Um, we also have a, a, tr a strong track record of strength. So we are the largest CMO within Los Angeles, and we are the second largest in California. Aspire is the, the one that is the largest in California. And Green Dot's always characterized for its boldness. So um, we have a history of, of kind of um, trailblazing and taking real risks. Um, lock transformation was one of them, but for us, it's really about how do we create a quality education for all students, and that requires a lot of boldness. Um, just so you can get a perspective of what the trajectory of Green Dot has been, we started in uh, 2000 with our first school, Animo Leadership. Animo Leadership is uh, located in the, Lenox, in the Lenox community. It is one of our founding five schools, and you can see over the years, we've, we've added quite a bit. This year, we're at about 10,000 students, just over 10,000 students. Um, I think this is a testimony to parents wanting other options. If we didn't have parents wanting to come to our schools, we wouldn't be able to grow in, in, at the pace that we have. So the bulk of our schools are mostly in South Los Angeles and Watts. We do have a school in Boyle Heights, and we do have a school in New York, but that's not included um, in this graph. So we're about 10,000 students this year. So one of the, the common criticisms, and probably can be true for a, a lot of schools, is that we don't serve kind of we don't serve the same students that Alley USD or traditional districts serve. So this is based on 2008 2009 data that we had available at the time. It's about the student racial makeup. So we're largely um, Latino, set almost 80 percent, 20 percent is African American, which mirrors the district. Also in the same categories as um, special ed, the district does have a, a slightly higher percentage for this year. Um, ELL learners and free and reduced lunch. Um, this is, so there are always questions about, are, are charter schools actually doing better? Or are they not? What, what's happening in terms of test scores? So what we did is we, um, we have analysis based on our independent charters are the ones, again, that I mentioned that we kind of just start up, no attendance boundaries. Our uh, independent charters plus lock are school transformation. So you can see there's a, a change in the numbers. And our comparable schools are the number of the, the neighborhood school that the student would normally attend if they were not attending our charter school. So you can see what the results are for there for that school and the Casey Cath rates for 10th grade. Um, why we succeed and what our core strengths are is we serve all students. So for us as an organization, it's important that we're able to address every student's need that walks through that door. We're able to focus on results and accountability. Since we have um, kind of a culture of transparency and performance, um, we're able to do that. We foster and support effective teaching. So we have a teacher's union. Um, that's really involved in evaluation and um, kind of in their, with their cohort, with their, their peers, not only on their campus, but at organizationally. Um, there's a lot of assessment and training and calibration amongst that. And then we also run a very strong um, emphasis on principals. So we have an administrative in residence program that's almost like a, a principal fellowship that many of our leaders go through. With, it's about 10 months. And it basically allows you to shadow current existing successful principals at our school sites to get a feel for what it would look like, assign you to different projects, and kind of prep you to actually be the leader of your own school of the following year, whether it be as an administrative, uh, excuse me, as an assistant principal or a principal. Um, so in, in 2008, kind of what Green Dot becomes most known for is the Lock Transformation um, Project, which is an unprecedented challenge. So Lock was an existing LAUSD school um, located in Watts. It was um, our first transformation, so it was a, a conversion. This time, the teachers actually signed a petition to turn uh, the school over to Green Dot Public Schools. It was one of the worst in the state. It was, and for us as, as Green Dot, it was actually a huge undertaking because it was 20 times the size of our previous school launches. So most of our schools start with 150 students, and then every year we add a year. When we took over LOCK, we had about uh, 2,400 students on day one. Um, so it was a very different, in terms of capacity and what it would actually take for us to do, it was a, a different project. Um, and we were actually the first CMO to actually take on a project like this. Um, it was a very different student population than we tend to, to serve. Um, when we inherited the class of students that were there, about 300 students were already cre severely credit deficient. So we had to come up with an alternative model to be able to serve those students. Um, three had, we had about 300 students with a full range of special needs, so um, MRM classes, different autistic classes, we had to make sure that those were available. And then we had also a, a group of juvenile justice returnees every year. 
and uh, and kind of when what we inherited there was it was, wasn't a college going culture. The students had a very different experience about what it was to be at school and what what it meant to actually be educated. So we really had to deal with that. And there were some community challenges, people not knowing what Green Dot were, and a lot of misinformation about charters and what we were going to do there. So it was actually a big undertaking um, and something that we we're proud that we did. There's, I think I only have a minute left. So let me go quickly through this. W the way we measure our turnarounds is through retention, rigor, and results. For us, one of the biggest things here, as you can see, as all the populations were declining in other neighborhood schools, locks actually started to increase once we started um, operating the campus, which was, a bit, which was important for us. What you'll see is um, the, first, the first bar on, on each, in each pair is where enrollment started on the first day of school and where it ended. So you can see um, how there's kind of a history. There's a lot of things that happen in the community. There's a lot of transiency, it's just the, the nature of the community, but there's a lot of people just kind of leaving. So we're very proud of, that we're able to not only start the year with more students, but retain a lot more students in the four years that we have been there. We also, um, you can look at the cohort retention. So at, if you look at LOC, when we took over, there were about 62% uh, were retained after the first year, but by the time they graduated, there were only 24% of students were actually still enrolled in the, in the school four years later. And we're actually in our first class of school um, graduates, so we're still, you know, it's decreasing, but we're definitely doing better than what it, what it used to be. Rigor, uh, so this is, you know, in California, you can have an A through G degree, and then you have your other degree that kind of just lets you get by. We actually require our students to take an A through G curriculum, and this is just um, showing that the, the increase of students who have been able to do that. And there's signs up. Okay. So final thoughts is just basically that uh, we know that transformations are difficult, but it's very important for us to be able to kind of have that dialogue and to make sure that students and families have different options to be successful. That was a great presentation. She did it real fast, but she covered a lot of information. I was like, hold that chart. Just a little bit more. I want to see that chart. But uh, uh, just for information, Armando will be able to email all the presentations of today. Make sure you drop your card and your email to him, and he'll send it out uh, uh, this week. Uh, and those of you who are watching, uh, email Armando at State Assembly. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Seth Bram. Uh, did I touch something here? Oh, no, I'm okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Seth Bramble, uh, who is a legislative advocate for the California Teachers Association uh, with emphasis in the areas of healthcare, language acquisition, and charter schools. He taught sixth grade in transitional public schools and traditional public schools for more than five years in San Jose, California. He was hired as a human rights consultant in the greater Los Angeles area for the California Teachers Association in 2006 and later served as executive director of the Sacramento Teachers Association. Uh, he has a master's degree in education with an emphasis on critical research. Seth Bramble. I didn't bring a snazzy PowerPoint. I actually love PowerPoint, and I like to make pictures move and entertain folks with PowerPoint. I just, I just didn't today. I wanted to apologize on behalf of Dr. Burt, who had to leave a little bit early. Uh, so so she won't be with us for the remainder of the panel. But I really wanted to thank the Latino Legislative Caucus Foundation for having this beautiful event and also for reaching out uh, to um, teachers to, to be such a central part of the conversation. I began my teaching career at Franklin McKinley uh, Elementary S School District in uh, San Jose at McKinley Elementary School. Actually, I had one student who didn't speak Spanish at home. Um, and what do I remember about that? It was a very different climate than we're in right now. Uh, that's just the reality. They were desperate for teachers. We've had now, what, tens of thousands of teacher layoffs for several years, and it's not the same climate. When I entered, I had an emergency permit, and they were hiring teachers with emergency permits to come into the schools. I came in in December to a school for three months who didn't have a teacher, who had had substitutes for three months. And so when I came in, the kids were pretty angry. Um, and I totally understand. I got, uh, I can't use some of the words that they called me even on day one in this, in this forum, but they were angry, and I imagine their parents were too from having to go through, you know, three months of a revolving door of substitute. Um, so I think in this discussion about charter schools, it's important to understand that there are folks who are not happy with what is happening at their school, and they're seeking something different. 
what happened in 92 with the Charter Schools Act was uh, the establishment of 100, I would call them lighthouse schools. The CAP was said, we're going to have 100 schools where I, I think the, the premise behind charter schools is this. What if as we were going along through the process and establishing new laws and creating new regulations, we didn't think about something and we just kind of moved past it? Uh, what happens if we've been going down the wrong path, you know? Uh, let's have a group of schools where you can do something totally different. You still have to, I think Dr. Birch expressed that, yeah, innovation in exchange for results. You still have to produce, but you know, you're given a little bit of freedom to do uh, something different. Uh, the goal is we're going to look at what you're doing and we're going to expand it across the system. I wish Dr. Birch um, was here because she made a statement which I thought was telling that there is no, I'm quoting her now, no evidence that changes in charters are triggering changes throughout the education system. And that's one of the primary problems is if you have a lighthouse successful school that's working, what we don't do enough is focus on knowledge transfer. What is working at your school and what can I do to apply it across the system? That's not the kind of conversation that generally happens. The target of charter schools in that original Charter Schools Act was intended to be low achieving students, students who are struggling in the traditional public school system. Um, and CTA believes truly that charter schools have a role in the education system uh, and we're really focused on um, trying to return to what the intent of charter schools were created to be. For example, charter schools are intended in part to serve low achieving students. When we look at achievement gap data, uh, we find more often that black and brown students are not uh, as successful in the public school system as their white and Asian counterparts. So you would expect to see a similar demographic being served, in fact, probably a more black and brown demographic being served in charter schools. Um, as uh, Dr. Burt suggested, and numerous studies suggest there are specific populations that are not served to the same degree at charter schools, English language learners being one of those um, populations. What is causing that? Well, let me give you a quick data point first, which is from, which one do I have here? I have several data points. Actually, I'm gonna, she, she presented you data that showed uh, English language learners were not served to the same degree. So, and I'm not talking about Green Dot. They did a great job. We have a number of charters that you know, do a great job uh, with specific populations. And then we have others that establish, for example, admission requirements. So let me uh, talk about a conflict in the law. You have a law that says you must accept all students, but then you have another portion of the law that says if you're a charter school in your petition, you have to list any admission requirements. Those admission requirements are getting more and more specific, and I would argue more and more discriminatory. An example of an admission requirement at um, what school am I going to go to? There's, there's a lot of admission requirements that have to do with parent volunteer time, the amount of time that your child can volunteer in a school. Or um, it's gotten a lot more specific in terms of just flat out test scores. Hmm. My problem is I printed this on like 15 pieces of data and now I can't find the pieces that I'm looking for. Okay, here's one from Excelsior Charter School, which is in Bars. They have two one in Barstow and one in Phelan, that requires the applicant to the charter school to submit school transcripts for the past two years, state test scores. If they're redesignated fluent English proficient, you must bring in the last three years of STAR test results. You must bring in the KC if applicable and the CELT test if applicable. I don't know another public school that requires you to bring forth all of that data before you're even admitted to the school, but it's certainly going to contribute to what kind of population is served at that particular school. So um, challenges like that are challenges we're trying to address legislatively. Um, another example is um, a piece that was carried by Mr. Chair, the Honorable Tony Mendoza, uh, Assembly Bill 1172, which focuses on um, who is in the best position to deliver oversight to a charter. We had uh, the Little Hoover Commission going up and down the state doing research, bringing together charter management operators, all the stakeholders, state board, uh, administration, teachers, PTA, everyone was invited to the conversation. 
And one of the common unifying messages that um, there was some agreement on um, was the fact that it's a problem to, for a charter petition to be able to kind of just shop around their charter petition first to the school board. And if they're told, well, you're not expressing how you're going to serve English language learners, then rather than fix it, they could potentially just go to the county and try again and then go to the state and try again. Now, the Charter Schools Association had a very different perspective of who they thought was in the best place. They also didn't like the shopping around, but I think they disagreed somewhat with uh, California Teachers Association take on it, that it should be the local school district. Why should it be the local school district? We elect people to work with the schools in that community, and those people are held accountable to that community. And if they're doing a bad job, they get unelected. And the community can access those folks because they can come to the school board meeting and have a discussion with that school board and say, hey, we need some change. The school board is the best place to have that oversight. Uh, we've had kind of continuing conversations about a side pro problem with having the school district be the primary authorizer, which is there's still animosity that occurs in a school district. Somehow there's still a perception that we're competing for ADA and for funds and for students. So we're going to have to overcome that. That's going to have to be something that's overcome. That does not change the fact that a school district does oversight of charter schools full time. That is their job. That, I'm not charter schools, I'm sorry, of the schools in their community full time. That's, that's what they do. That's their primary mission. So um, that is, you know, really the place that, that um, charter school oversight is best placed. And that's really the intent of that bill. Um, in terms of um, results, there was some discussion of charter schools performing not significantly different um, from the USC study. Um, interestingly, I wish you were still here because I read this study that was put out by USC, and it does make a statement within the study. This is a 2010, I'm sorry, yes, 2010 study by the Center of Educational Governance called Charter School Indicators, which says essentially that charter school performance is improving drastically and that it continues to lag behind traditional public schools. Uh, there was a comprehensive study done by Stanford University that's often cited with regards to charter school performance. Uh, in 16 states, there was research done. Uh, it covered 70% of the nation's students that attend charter schools, and it looked at starting uh, achievement primarily in those things that we measure, so math and language arts. It did not find a significant, and I'm speaking specifically to the Latino, Chicano, Mexicano population, it did not find a particular uh, difference with regards to language scores at charter schools versus at traditional public schools. But it did find a very significant difference in math. It says essentially that charter schools have a negative and significant impact on Hispanic students in California when it comes to math instruction. And it feels to me like a relevant discussion to be having when we're talking about what kinds of things will best serve kids in our community. Now, it varies, of course, state to state. Wow, I didn't get a one minute warning. Maybe I didn't see. Oh, <laughs> my time is up. Let me hit my conclusion. A couple, I'm just reading to you some of our policy because I think it's important that we're not caught up in um, how the media portrays uh, a conflict. Uh, again, we have teachers uh, who are members who work at charter schools, counselors, librarians, nurses who are working at charter schools who are members of CTA. Um, and so it's part of our core belief that, you know, certainly uh, they have a solid place within, charter schools have a solid place within our public school system. And so what are we fighting for? Let me take a one second. Did I put these out of order? Okay. CTA believes charter schools shall be established only to improve student learning, increase learning opportunities for all pupils with special emphasis on expanding experiences for pupils who are identified as academically low achieving. Uh, CTA believes that charter schools um, encourage the use of different and innovative teaching methods, create new professional opportunities for educators, uh, provide parents and pupils with expanded choices, and we fight to improve the teachers, the teaching and learning conditions at all schools, whether they be traditional, public, at charter schools. We fight to ensure that the human dignity and civil rights of all children and youth are protected, and certainly we fight to secure a more just, equitable, and democratic uh, society. Thank you so much for your time.
Okay, we, ha we have a few minutes for question and answer before we go to our next panel. Uh, if you have any, just raise your hand. Um, okay. Okay, we don't have, okay, we have one here, and we'll be. Uh, Saeed Ali, uh, just a general comment. I think um, I had the good fortune to be there when the legislature discussed the creation of the court. And it never was went through as long as Senator Art Forrest was never the legislature. Senator Forrest's question was exactly what we have heard. He had predicted three things. One, the privatization of uh, schools that primarily serve poor children, and within that population, a self-selection process, which would make it harder for the public schools to serve the rest. Uh, secondly, privatization leading to the monetization of taxpayer dollars, which is increasingly occurring. So one of my sons, the friend from Deloitte and Touche, is the money man for Green Dot. He used to work before that in the financial sector on derivatives. This is a serious business now. And then the third that issue he raised is the whole question of what is the purpose of a taxpayer-funded public school system? That is, how do you assure the common purpose of the common school system that Thomas Jefferson envisioned, which is the foundation of the American school? So it's been 15 years since the Charter School Act, Senator Hart's bill, became law. But this would be an appropriate time to perhaps do an overview, something like a sunset review, to see what some of the original goals that the proponent of charter schools held, especially Senator Hart, the author, which is how do you improve the public schools by using the charter school concept to bring in fresh ideas, new initiatives, and practices that can help the common schooling system for all. Thank you. Is that more like a comment, I guess, or an answer to that? part of the, the sharing um, and the learnings that we want to do because that work is very different. The other thing you, um, you mentioned was about gleaning or evaluating what charters are actually doing and I think that that's an excellent point. One of the big things that allow us to be successful is flexibility in terms of how our different funds are allocated. So even though we get the same public dollar, we have less categoricals that traditional districts uh, have to comply with. And I know in this past year with all the different, with the budget crisis, some uh, districts were able to get some of that same flexibility and I think that was helpful for districts to be able to then look at student needs and prioritize how they wanted to spend the money as opposed to how the state was telling them. So I think using charters in that way and seeing what kind of things we have in place that help us to be more flexible and successful and how that tra translates into a more traditional public school system are, are things that both systems can benefit from. And, and you spoke some, I think, about knowledge transfer. I'm going to put Oakland out there. But at, at the Hoover Commission, uh, what I saw when they visited Oakland was intriguing because it showed two opposite spectrums, one very positive and one very negative, which kind of surrounds some of the tension around this issue. You had the school board president there, and the school board president was kind of saying to the folks, you're not part of my district. And the charter schools were looking up and saying, we're definitely part of your district. You have authorized us. And then there was also the staff person who's responsible for working with charters within the district. And that person was talking about all of these crazy, I hadn't even heard of them, innovative programs that bring together principals from charters, from traditional public schools into the room together to talk about best practices, what's working, and really exchange information, which I believe is kind of the intent of why uh, this program came into effect was let's learn from each other. Let's find out what's working with kids and make it happen. So I'm watching that dynamic occur, but I would say that there is a system in place that works, and it works, again, when we have one central school district that is over both the charters and the traditional schools in that district so that the principals can come together. That bill's 11, 1172, Assembly Bill 1172. Thank you. Oh, one more question up here in the front. The question, the question I had was re regarding the, um, the schools in Los Angeles, not the 
lock, but the other ones, that when you take an attendance boundary, you've taken away the element of a charter school, which is choice, because those parents no longer have a choice. They technically do, but geographically they don't, and most of them are not informed that they do have a choice. And in those schools, those were given to Green Dot, in this case, against the will of the teachers and the community, and it was done by the school board. So you've, in the other point I'd make about that is we're not doing that in Northridge. We're not doing that on the west side. We're doing this in schools with our least politically empowered uh, communities. I understand your concern there. I think what we're seeing in, in the instance you're referring to is what happened at Henry Clay Middle School. Um, through public school choice, we, um, as long with other providers, applied to operate that campus. Parents are voting with their feet. Our enrollment is higher than it has been in the past several years, including in sixth grade. So I know there were some initial concerns, a lot of misinformation about who we are and what we want to do. But I think parents have shown um, at least their willingness to come back into the district and to be able to see what the options are. And for us, it's not about blaming the teachers there or that they were doing a bad job. I think you have a system that is designed, unfortunately, in some cases, to not put the students first. And, and, and the way it got played in the media was that the teachers were doing a bad job. And we don't necessarily think that's the case. For us, it's about how are we going to get the best schools there. And we had the opportunity to do that. And so that's what's happening at that school. Um, I, I, having heard the discussion around parent choice, I just want to bring up that there was another piece of legislation that actually made it all the way through to the governor's desk, Assembly Bill 1034, which talked about, as I mentioned earlier, removing uh, admission requirements at charter schools, essentially uh, increasing student access at charter schools. Very interesting conversations with the governor uh, and the governor's office. Um, we were essentially saying, uh, you know, a family or parent choice is not, does not mean the school has the ability to choose which students come into that school site. And that's in effect happening at a number of schools, uh, physically selecting. In fact, uh, there was a school that has an entire summer program where uh, they watch the kids, how they're behaving, how they're scoring, and then at the end of kind of that trial period, they determine which students they're going to accept into the school. That is not what was intended in, in this program, and that's why there's a need to revisit why we have this program. If they're taxpayer dollars, it should be available to all taxpayers and their family. The, um, right here? That bill oh, was front. vetoed. Sorry. Oh, vetoed, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, uh, Warren, at your United Teachers Los Angeles Prep. Uh, I, I, is this on? Thank you. Um, my concern is that I appreciate your personal statement um, somehow clearing the teachers at uh, Clay Middle School for any failures that happened at the school. But I also watched your sales presentation where you referred to public schools as dropout factories. I have no interest in demonizing you or your intentions or the good work that your, your teachers do in your schools, and I would ask that you and your organization extend the same level of respect and just basic human dignity to people who teach in public schools every day. Before I was president of the United Teachers Los Angeles, three months ago, I was teaching in an option school that specializes in at-risk students, a lot of girls with babies, a lot of boys with probation officers. We who do that every day do not appreciate being described as people who are running dropout factories. I don't question your intentions, and I would ask that you do the same for us. I apologize if I offended you. It's actually not a term that Green Dot coined by any stretch of the imagination. I know it's on the PowerPoint. It's a national study that that term is used, but I appreciate that, and I will take that into consideration. I'm, mm -hmm. I apologize if I offended you and your colleagues. That was not the intent. Great. Well, the, uh, seeing that the, uh, we had a good discussion, uh, obviously, uh, when it comes to charter schools and public schools, there's that versus part jumped out again, all right? But it's, uh, but it's uh, we're coexisting, and we got to learn how to coexist. And I think um, uh, Steve Barr has said it himself, and one of the times that I've spoken with him is like, we can't charter school our way out of the, the situation that we're in. We got to work together and improve public education across the board. And we have a lot of things that we could work on together that, we, that we've summarized a little bit today. But uh, uh, the issue is still not going to go away. We could continue to work together on, on improving public education. 
Uh, we're going to go ahead and begin our next panel. And as, as we are transitioning from this panel to the next one, I want to uh, briefly just thank and acknowledge here the president of uh, Long Beach City College here, uh, our uh, Eloy o uh, Ortiz Oakley, just coming in now. And uh, thank you again for your hospitality. And you're going to be part of our panel. Our, the person that's going to be leading the next panel is going to be our uh, assembly member here from Bell Gardens. Uh, Ricardo Lara, who was the chair of uh, Joint Legislative Audit Committee. Uh, he's, a, he's a freshman member with a lot of experience uh, when it comes to the state legislature, as he has worked with several members, understands the in and outs of the, of the Capitol. Uh, and um, we're fortunate to have him here to lead the next panel. And please help me welcome our assembly member, Ricardo Lara. Okay, now for the fun part of the program. We are gonna go ahead and uh, start. We have our panelists ready. Great. Uh, good afternoon. Today's session is designed to help us understand the importance of access to a post-secondary education and the options that a technical education can offer students competing in our workforce. Um, as a huge proponent of access, in particular as it pertains to keeping the cost of post-secondary education low. Because as we all know, uh, this can have a detrimental impact in the ability of students to access and complete college. For many students, the total cost of attendance for a college has reached a point in which many students can no longer have the financial capacity to enroll in any post-secondary institution. We also know that the economic downturn has disproportionately affected Latino families. Hardest hit by this crisis are those who can least afford college, to begin with, uh, low-income families for whom the financial burden of education has increased the fastest. Even as access to college is becoming a greater challenge, opinion polls indicate that more and more Americans believe a college education is essential to a successful, productive life and those, as, of, as opposed to those without a degree. Um, since taking office, I have witnessed tuition grow exponentially to the point where college affordability can act as a deterrent for students who dream on pursuing a higher education. Planning for these things uh, has also be become more difficult for students who face, face mid-year fee hikes, often without any notice, as we've seen over the past couple of years. These effects um, of these extraordinary fee hikes may push students to drop out, uh, out of school and make the choice not to go to school altogether. While we all know Latinos seem uh, Latinos have seen the largest population growth in recent years. College attainment has not kept pace with this growth. Um, in California, the gap is the largest with 15% of Latino adults with a college degree versus 50% of their white counterparts. By the year 2050, it is estimated that the Latino population will account for 30% of our U.S. population. There's no doubt that Latino educational success will have a huge impact on the size and strength of our nation's workforce and economy. Uh, by 2018, it is estimated that 63% of all jobs will require a post-secondary degree. Uh, however, uh, the daunting uh, fact is, according to the National Conference of State Legislators, for the first time ever in our history as a country, the younger U.S. generation is less educated than the older generation. That is, that is a very important fact to note and one that we need need to work to change. Uh, unless we can address the issues making college access so challenging for our students, our entire state and country will be affected. Um, educational equity, attainment, and accessibility are the reasons why I serve in the Assembly today. I am honored to be here to discuss these important issues with all of you. Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the first of our three speakers this afternoon. First, we're going to begin with our superintendent, Eloy Ortiz Oakley, superintendent, president of Long Beach, uh, our Long Beach City College District. Mr. Ortiz is a superintendent, as we said. Before joining LBCC, he was the first, the vice president of college services at Oxnard College and the former assistant vice president of property and casualty division of Keenan and Associates. Superintendent, president, the mic is yours. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to my home. <laughs> it's great to see you all here. And on behalf of all the faculty and staff and our students here at Long Beach City College, welcome. 
I'm sorry I missed you this morning. I got caught in a little bit of traffic on the way here, but uh, I understand uh, one of my fine board members did an excellent job of welcoming you. So again, welcome to Long Beach City College. Uh, Long Beach City College is um, really in the middle of this whole conversation about Latino student success. This is what we're all about. Obviously not just about Latinos, but because Latinos are such a growing population here in, in Long Beach, and we see our workforce as becoming more and more Latino, we've really made an emphasis to ensure that our African-American Latino students and, and all students of, of uh, backgrounds that um, um, uh, have been underrepresented in higher education, that we put a particular focus on this. So, uh, briefly, because I could talk to you all afternoon, let me say a few words to begin with. We can no longer, in this state or in this country, continue to operate as we've been operating. Whatever ideas we had 40 years ago, whether it was the master plan or whether it was you know, some grand ideas about how we're going to educate our citizens in California, has not worked. We've got to look at this very differently. We have, in this state, Latinos who are turning out in greater, greater numbers into higher education, and primarily through our doors in community college. But when you look at the numbers, only 17% of those students, those Latinos, are going to finish. Only 17% are going to finish any kind of credential. What does that say to us? Beyond that, if we look at uh, African Americans, no better. What does that say to us in California about our workforce? What does that say to us about ourselves as Latinos in this state? Well, what's going to happen to this state if we cannot begin to educate our individuals so that they can compete in this economy? Particularly at a time when we are not going to get any more resources in public education. You know, with all due respect to my colleagues in, in the Assembly and the Latino Caucus, there is just not enough revenue coming anytime soon for us to really bank on any new money. So what are we going to do? We need to begin to focus. Yes, we have an issue of accessibility. Yes, we have CSU and UC tuition going through the roof all of a sudden. Community college tuition will probably go to $46 a unit next year. That is a real issue. We need to continue to work with the administration and continue to push for Pell Grant, for Pell Accessibility. That is our, our, our greatest entry into higher education. I'm sure many of you saw the, the numbers lately that the greatest surge in college going is in Latinos these days. Why? Because the administration has been successful at increasing Pell Grants. We need to continue doing that. But getting them access is not the only story. We educate about 2.7 million students in California community colleges. 2.7 million. But again, we can't get them out the other side. We've got to put a renewed emphasis on ensuring that students can finish. We've got to get them to finish. In this economy, they are not going to be able to compete. You all know that I'm preaching to the choir. So what can we do about it? Here at Long Beach, we've got an emphasis on focusing on partnering with our K-12 district. We spent a lot of time working with Long Beach Unified, which is, you're familiar with Long Beach Unified, it's uh, about the third largest uh, unified school district in California, uh, and it's one of the best known unified school districts for improving and closing the achievement gap in the country. Considered by McKenzie and Company one of the best urban school districts in the nation. But even there, we've got a long way to go. So we've been working hard with our partners, Cal State Long Beach and Long Beach Unified, to focus on what we call the Long Beach College Promise, to begin working early in K-12 to align what we do there with what we do here. And I know that's a simple statement to make, but we've got to begin to do that, and we've got to be deliberate about that. There are a number of, uh, of efforts that we're engaged with. Every, everything from having every fourth grader visit Long Beach City College, which is about 6,000 of them, to educating parents, to continuing every year until they graduate from high school, to educate them 
about the importance of going to college and how to do it. We also create pathways for them because we all know that not every student is going to transfer for, to a four-year university, but every student needs some sort of credential in order to compete. So we're constantly working on creating pathways, pathways for every single student, so that no matter where they're at in their point or what their educational goal is, they have a way to go. We're also looking at the way that we assess students. One of the greatest tragedies that we have in this state and this country is how we assess and place students. Here at Long Beach City College, and we're not unlike any other urban school community college district, over 90% of our students who assess, assess below the pre-collegiate level. That means that they're going to be in some sort of remedial course in either English, math, or reading. And if you break down those numbers of that 90%, well, guess what color they are? They're black and they're Latino. And then if you continue to look at the numbers, students who begin in developmental education, it's single digits, the likelihood that they are going to succeed. So when you look at the transfer rates, the completion rates, you start to quickly figure out why we're in this boat, because so many of our students are in remedial education. So how do they get there? They get there, one, because yes, some of them are not prepared, but two, because of the way we assess students in this state. We have 112 colleges in the California Community College System, and right now, each 112 colleges has their own way of assessing students. We've got to begin to change that. We also have to begin to change the way that we assess students. We need to work more closely with the high schools, more closely with the K-12 districts to understand what's happening in the K-12 and to evaluate how to place them in community college. That's one of the projects that we're currently working on. We're working with uh, our K-12 partner, Long Beach Unified, to create capstone courses in English and math in the senior year of high school. Because if you think about it, Unless your student in high school is on a CSU or UC pathway, they're probably wasting their senior year because they only need two years of math to graduate from high school. So unless they're on CSU or UC track, they're probably not taking any math in their senior year. But if you look at what kills students, it's exactly that. If they can't finish college level algebra, they go nowhere. Nowhere. So we need to begin to work with our K-12 partners, and I know the Common Core is beginning to creep up through our K-12 system, and that will help, but we need to be more deliberate in working with our high schools to ensure that we're aligning expectations and are aligning our curriculum. Uh, you know, we'd love to talk to you about what we're doing the Long Beach College Promise, but I know we, we don't have that, that much time. So let me also talk about what else is going on as a system. Up on the screen, you have the website for the California Community College Chancellor's Office. Uh, due to uh, Senate Bill 1143 last year, Senator Carol Liu, the community colleges were required to convene a task force on student success. They are just now completing their work and have issued their draft recommendations on how to improve outcomes for students. One of the main priorities is to close the, close the achievement gaps we have in community colleges. And they've issued a list of recommendations that are now out for public review. These recommendations will come in the form of regulatory changes, which will be taken up by our Board of Governors, as well as legislative uh, activities. So I ask all of you to become familiar with these task force recommendations. There's some controversy in there, but in order for our system to better serve Latinos and African Americans, we need to make these changes. We need to become much more prescriptive with our students. We need to begin to front load those things that we know will help students be successful, such as requiring them to make academic progress as part of their uh, financial aid, their board governor fee waivers, requiring them to, be, to go through orientation, requiring them to have some sort of educational plan up front, you know, we send our best kids to the finest schools, and when we send them to those schools, they are not given a choice about what to take in their first year. They're not given a choice as to whether or not they should take a college success course or an orientation course. 
So we treat our best prepared students that way, but our least prepared students, we give them ultimate choice. And we don't give them the necessary tools up front to make sure that they're successful. And that's what we'd like to change. These task force recommendations must be taken as a package because if we could begin to pick them apart, the effect begins to dissipate. So I hope that you all become familiar and support the, the Chancellor's Office. I look to my colleagues in the, uh, the Assembly and the Senate to give these uh, changes that are coming an opportunity to be heard and to give our students and community colleges a chance to succeed. Again, we cannot continue to operate the way we've been operating. It has not been successful. We need to give our students an opportunity to succeed and we need to hold our institutions accountable for their success. Everyone's success. And not just on the basis of the top 10% of students who go on to transfer. We need all of our students to succeed. They need to be succeeding in terms of certificates, associate degrees, or transferring. In this economy, we need to demand that kind of accountability. Otherwise, our students are doomed to failure in this economy. They will not have the breadth and fundamentals that they need in order to co compete. So, I thank you. I'm um, getting the one minute warning. Uh, thank you for coming to join us here at Long Beach City College and um, look forward to um, working with each and every one of you and ensuring that all of our students have a realistic opportunity for success. Thanks. Thank you, President. Appreciate your words and, and know that us in the Latino Caucus take it very seriously and we do understand we need major change in order for our students to succeed. Next, we're gonna have um, Pala Munoz, Ventura County Community College District. Ms. Munoz is uh, the Extended Opportunity Program and Services Director at Ventura Community College. That's awesome, because without EOP, I would not be here. Uh, she sits on the Ca California Community College EOPS Board as past president and regional governor on the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges Board. Welcome, Ms. Munoz, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me here. My name is Paula Munoz, as he said, and I'm an EOPS director at Ventura Community College. Um, EOPS, for those of you, how many of you are EOPS people here? Sure, former counts. Well, EOPS, EOPS stands for Extended Opportunities Programs and Services. It is, it is a legislated, mandated, categorical state program. It was started by Senator Alquest in 1969, who had the vision to put forth SB 164. So uh, EOPS exists in the community colleges. We call it EOPS. And what we do in EOPS is basically um, target the low-income and educationally disadvantaged students. We are to recruit them, bring them into the colleges, give them orientation, give, make sure they go through assessments. And we do a lot of invasive extreme counseling and we make sure they reach their goals, whether it be to get a degree, a certificate, or to transfer into university. So EOPS, has, I believe, has been very successful. We have served many, many students. Some of them are here. And um, EOPS, by the way, is all over the Student Success Task Force. Student Success Task Force recommendations, a lot of them are based on the success of EOPS although EOPS is not mentioned as a, a student success program. So I would like to start out by um, thanking the legislature also uh, with the passage of AB 131, the California Dream Act. I don't think that I need to convince this group of how important its passage is for our students and community. I would like to also frame my presentation around a student story, a student that this assembly probably is very familiar with. Let me tell you about Eddie Hernandez. Eddie was born and raised in Oxnard, California. He attended Oxnard schools. He lived in an area of Oxnard called La Colonia. He barely graduated from high school. He ran with a gang. He got busted. He ended up doing time. He also had, at a very young age, he fathered a young child. When Eddie was released from, from prison, he went to a community fair where he ended up speaking to an EOPS Ventura College recruiter. This recruit, recruiter spoke to Eddie about the opportunities that the college could offer him. Eddie eventually decided he would check out Ventura College. Eddie had a below 2.50 high school grade point average. He had taken 
fairly basic and completed math courses. The EOPS recruiter, however, convinced him that it would be okay. He would not be turned away, he would get help. In the back of Eddie's mind, he kept thinking, I'm going to college. I'm going to college. Finally, it became, I'm going to college. Eddie showed up at Ventura College EOPS and was assisted every step of the way. He was helped out with his, first of all, his admit, college admissions application, his financial aid application. He was, of course, very low income. The Board of Governors waiver, he was helped with applying for that, which pays for his registration fee. Now it is $36 a unit. He was sent to take the college assessment and English math assessments, English and math assessments. He agreed to enroll in a required EOPS one unit college orientation course. He signed the EOPS Ventura College mutual, student mutual responsibility contract where he agreed to enroll in 12 units a semester and meet with an EOPS counselor three times a semester and maintain a 2.0 GPA. Eddie struggled, and we would figure he would struggle, the first two semesters. He was not a prepared college student. He was a first-generation college student. The worldview of his family was not that of college. He had no study skills. He also was a single parent with a little boy, and Eddie also had to work. He needed college basic skills, English and math classes. Without the required college level English, it was a struggle for him to barely survive some of the basic college level general, general ed courses. Eddie, however, hung in there. He relied heavily on EOPS counselors. He used the extra funded EOPS tutoring services. And eventually, by the third semester, he pulled his grades up and out of the financial aid and college probation. He was, he, however, had not decided on a college major yet. Now, let me shift a little bit to what is happening now in our educational systems. As you all know, all of our educational systems have taken and continue to take big budget cuts. Our educational systems are not only suffering tremendous budget cuts, they are being attacked. Accountability is a name, and our California master plan may be no more. This comes at a time when all of our educational systems are attempting to serve a fast-growing Latino student population. This comes at a time when more of this population were barely making it through high school to community colleges and on to four-year universities. Not in the numbers that they should be, but nonetheless, some progress was being made there. Let me now bring your attention to the, to the proposed legislation and th that threatens the California Master Plan and the fulfillment of dreams for our growing Latino student populations. It is SB 1143, the Lou Bill, that was spoken about just a little bit ago. It, it, it originally proposed to change the way community colleges were funded. It proposed that community colleges be funded on a, a performance-based basis. It would have penalized community colleges $480 million if the colleges did not have a 100% completion rate. The community colleges, the largest higher ed system in the country, a system that has welcomed any high school graduate or 18-year-old individual without a high school degree that demonstrated the ability to learn, a system of access, a system of second chances, a system for college certificates, career and technical degrees, life learning courses, and the opportunity to transfer to four-year universities. Out of this proposal, SB 1143 was born a California Community Colleges Student Success Task Force, which you just heard about a little bit ago. After meeting for about a year, this task force now has, is making recommendations for changes to the community college systems. There are many recommendations. The ones that I am most concerned with are the following. One, that the enrollment priority for continuing students will be lost if the students are placed for two consecutive terms on academic probation, which is the GPA below 2.0 after attempting 12 or more units, or progress probation, failure to successfully complete at least 50% of their classes. Two, that low-income students who, re who receive the Board of Governors fee waiver, a waiver for college registration fees of $36 a unit, will be required to meet institutional satisfactory progress to be eligible for the fee waiver renewal. My concern about these two recommendations is that there are already academic policies in place that are not as harsh, that deal with students that are not successful in courses. 
The Student Success Task Force claims that this last recommendation will result in a cost savings of $89 million, that these savings would be reallocated within the community college system and used to reinvest in the student support and retention activities identified in the Student Success Plan. The cost savings would disenfranchise more than 200,000 students. This would allow students that do not need Board of Governors waivers to continue in college. These savings would be on the backs of the poor. They would be on the backs of many of our students. Another recommendation is, one, is to fold um, into one block grant the college categoricals, which they call flexibility, to put into one pot where each college can decide what is best to fund at their own campuses. This is problematic because these categoricals, which are legislated for good reason, they are mandated to exist because the system cannot be trusted to do what it's supposed to do. The last recommendation is perhaps to move basic skills in the community colleges to adult ed. The task force was based on legislation that community colleges have too much money. We have been working on a shoestring. The ta these these task force recommendations are not new. They do not address the complexity of our populations of students of colors. There is, however, a lot of service, lip service to equity. There is really no, no way to pay for a lot of the task force recommendations. And there is a false dichotomy that we focus on access and not success. Let's go back to Eddie. Eddie did finally decide on a major. He completed Ventura College with high honors. He graduated, was accepted to USC. He graduated from there and pursued and completed a master's degree also from USC. Eddie represents many of our Latino student stories, student success stories. We all know an Eddie. Eddie probably could not have succeeded if the student success task force recommendations were in place. He would have lost the bog waiver and would not have been able to secure the classes he needed because he, because he also would lose enrollment priority. There have to be mandated policies, m mandates and policies in place that are, are future, that are future thinking. Otherwise, our Latino students are going to be shut out and they are going to remain a service class. And our Latino male, males like Eddie will continue to fill our prisons. The California Master Plan has served us well and can continue to make dreams come true for our Latino populations if we, if we retain access in our community colleges. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to have Elena Strangle Bertram from DeVry University. She is the Senior Director of Government Relations and Public Policy at DeVry Inc. Prior to joining DeVry, DeVry uh, can't even speak, she served as the Assistant Director of State Relations for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. She also formerly worked as the Legislative Director for Texas Representative Trey Martinez Fisher and as Chief of Staff to the late Texas State Representative Irma Rangel. Welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So last presentation of the day, um, but we're going to stay fired up, right? All right. Very good. So I'm going to burn through some of these slides very quickly, um, just for the purposes of us, us understanding our table stakes. I know this is old hat to everybody now, but we're all very familiar with President Obama's call that we regain our prominence as the most educated country in the world. And we understand that of the fastest growing occupations in this country, half um, will require some sort of, of degree, a baccalaureate degree. So we understand very clearly there, is an, there are international implications to what it is that we're doing, and there are implications to our workforce. So let's look at the, the, the paint by numbers here, knowing that this means We've got to increase our degree attainment rate by 20%, which is no small feat. That this means 10 million additional Americans, ages 25 to 34, to get an associate or baccalaureate degree. That's 8 million beyond just projected growth. That 3.7 million of those college graduates uh, have to come from a high school pool of graduates, so more students more Latinos in particular, more people of color graduating from high school and, and college, and 6.3 million adult learners that go to college. And we often forget about adult learners. So I, I want to make sure that we speak to their needs. In preparing for this talk, 
I wanted an overall snapshot of where California is at in terms of its enrollment disaggregated by race and where our institutions that I'm here to represent are. And if we focus in on Hispanic or Latino participation, we'll see California 29% overall, DeVry University in particular at 36%. So obviously we have a significant Latino uh, population at our school, our Carrington College, California, right at 25%. I also thought it was worth looking at our fastest growing education. Um, this isn't an all-inclusive list, but you know, we understand, we see some themes here. We see healthcare professions being a growing, uh, a growing occupation, technology, business technology, and education, of course, uh, and the allied health field. So all areas where we focus on that is precisely what we do at both DeVry University. Quick snapshot of DeVry in California, focused on associate baccalaureate and master's level programs. Am I being really loud? Better, better. Can everyone hear me? Sorry about that. DeVry University, California, uh, focused on associate, baccalaureate, and master's level programs, regionally accredited institution with 16 campuses across California, over 13,000 students, and 62% of our students are adult learners. Um, we obviously offer our courses both on site online and in a blended modality and we happen just by virtue of our niche to be very focused on stem so in particular the technology area we have electrical engineering technology computer information systems all the ones you see there and according to diverse issues in higher education uh, fourth largest california baccalaureate producer in engineering technology and engineering related fields sixth largest california baccalaureate producer of computer information sciences and support services. Another quick snapshot of Carrington, focused on certificate and associate degree programs in the health-related fields, WASC Junior accredited, similar flexible study options, 10 campuses, over 6,500 students across the state, 44% adult learner. Programs, again, focused on the allied health area, sixth largest California associate degree producer of Latinos in practical nursing, vocational nursing, et cetera. So I was asked to speak specifically on student access. And when I think about access and think about our mission at our institutions, um, I, can, I can speak to what we've kind of always done. Um, and we happen to serve a significant proportion of, of minority students. And we found that the way we do that most successfully is to lever leverage technology in different learning modalities. That means bringing education to students in a way that in the past hadn't been afforded to students. So on-site, online, blended learning again, and meeting students precisely where they're at. As you just heard, I don't necessarily need to repeat all of it, but we've got a significant number of students who come to our doors that are not college ready. And so what we've chosen to do at DeVry is offer foundations or skills development coursework to students at no cost to that student. Um, that's focused on math and English in particular, to get them at a place where they are comfortable with college level work, to afford them the opportunity to work with a tutor to get to a place where they're comfortable with college level work and then move them on through their program. We also fundamentally believe in easing transfer. There's a lot of artificial boundaries that exist in a student college experience. And I know a lot of us know about this, where I took a math 101 class in Austin and then wanted to transfer it, I'll pick on myself, to the University of Texas. And there was a fight sometime in doing that. So if we could think about ways of streamlining this process and eliminating those hurdles towards matriculation for our students. It's just a completely unnecessary hurdle. Institutions have to maintain their ability to review the quality of the sending institution and the course, but there are ways that we can do this and we can do it better. And articulation agreements. So creating educational pathways for students who often begin at a community college just like this, but then want to move on to whatever four-year institution that works for them and where they're at. So how we support our students at, at DeVry. 
We have a student central model, which sounds a lot like what I just heard my esteemed panelists talk about, where each student has a student success coach and a student finance consultant that is devoted to them. And it is a team approach where a student is, is essentially uh, encompassed by these services. Um, and in, when we ensure that that student stays on that pathway to complete their program requirements and they are informed consumers when it comes to their student financial aid package. So what a student success coach does, this coach reviews the student's portfolio. So they come, when they come into the door and enroll at DeVry, what do you want to do? How do you want to do it? How are we going to do this together? Make sure that the student is making appropriate academic pro progress, is enrolled in all the right courses, they monitor their attendance, meaning if you are a student at DeVry University and you do not show up for class, somebody is going to call you um, because we take this service quite seriously. The student success coach also monitors their grades um, or any other sort of red flags to see what they can do um, in terms of intrusive advising to, to help address the student's needs. In terms of the student finance consultant, a lot of our students don't come from a legacy of post-secondary education, and so the financial aid process is incredibly confusing. What we do is make sure that that student, from soup to nuts, understands the financial aid process, gets all their questions answered, and throughout the course of their educational experience um, is advised of exactly how, many, how much loans they're taking out and what that means in terms of repaying that loan at a date certain. We also have uh, the Aspire program, which is often not at least discussed in these kinds of forums, but our students are afforded direct and confidential access to a professional counselor. You know, our students often work, they come uh, to us as single parents or from different kind of family situations, familial situations, and need some support, and we afford that to them in a way that is very confidential and mindful of where they're at and obviously lifetime career services. So beyond resume writing, but some basic things that some of us I know I was not fully aware of when I was a, a student graduating. How do you present yourself at an interview? What do you wear to an interview? How do you conduct yourself as a professional individual, period? So we offer that, again, lifetime. So I know I have about 30 seconds left, but there were some other things that I really felt merited, converse, uh, merited, merited discussion here. And this was, you know, we had the whole presentation on inputs, but again, looking at outputs and kind of what we call measuring what matters through two pillars of metrics of accountability and standards of best practice. So some of the things that we think merit consideration from a, from a public policy standpoint are measure how we, how we enable students to learn. Did our students learn? Are they graduating on time? Are they gainfully employed? Are they passing their licensure rates on, uh, at the appropriate level that they should? Are they paying their loans back? And then standards of best practice. So robust disclosure, are we telling them exactly how much their program costs, exactly what their employment, uh, their employment forecast looks like? Um, are they aware of what uh, their loan debt's gonna be, annual compliance training? So making, making sure that all of our people across our organization are fluent in what the language that our students speak and communicate th that to them, cross their T's, dot their I's, and audits, meaning inspect what you expect. So this is just sort of a nutshell of, of what we do. I um, appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Hope we have a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. At this point, we're gonna open up for questions from our guests. Are there any questions at this time? My comadre has a question over there. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Josefina Canchola. I'm the Associate Director of the University of California's Puente Project. And a couple of things. I think uh, as uh, California public institutions, we often forget that we have a land grant responsibility to serve the demographics of California, which as we all know, it's largely Latino. So we definitely are not meeting that goal. Um, but you know, one of the things that I've encountered with our community college Puente students is that a lot of our students are puzzle piecing their, um, their classes together. 
So aside from all the day-to-day -day challenges of going to school, they're having to find buses and rides to a number of institutions just to be able to carry a full student load. Um, so I would like you to address that. And then secondly, um, you know, in, in the Puente Project, what we try to do is to support the um, students' development so they can go ahead and, and move on to four-year institutions and graduate and come back to their community. But unfortunately, we're not embraced by all of the institutions that we serve. Um, and so, uh, particularly to uh, or, um, Eloy, uh, I would like to uh, address, you know, this question to you. How do we, uh, as an organization, um, get to work with administrators that would be more open to the support that we're providing to meet the same uh, goals as the community colleges, which is to transfer students and graduate them? Um, let me give you a general answer and then try to be more specific. First of all, uh, you know, I think our, our Puente programs, the UC Puente program, Community College Puente program, are all wonderful programs. But if we're going to truly serve Latinos, we need to quit thinking in terms of Puente programs and think in terms of the entire population of Latino students and take what we've learned from Puente, from EOPS, and scale it up so that all of our students are served in that regard. Now we do need to do a better job of serving those students in the way we schedule their classes, because you're right. Um, many of them, whether they be on financial aid or, or working, are trying to cobble together courses and not getting the courses they need to become UC eligible. We need to look at scheduling very differently. We need to be able to front load courses for these students up front in their first year and, and really in some cases not give them much of a choice because we know what courses they're going to need to transfer. How can you do a better job of connecting with community colleges? Well, I, I think the UC system in general has to do a better job of connecting with community colleges because you know, we, we all have uh, our issues with the, the numbers that were particularly the numbers of of students of color that are getting into the UC system. But I think if we look at the models such as the one we have now with the CSU system, SB 1440 and the transfer associates degree uh, pathways, if we can begin to create similar transfer pathways with the UC system, we will serve many more Latino students because that's who we're really targeting is those students who need clear pathways into the UC system. We're beginning to create them with the CSU. We need to do the same thing with the UC system. Any other questions? Or... Actually, I had a... <laughs> uh, and should we hold off before saying we shouldn't focus on those programs anymore because now we need to scale up until we actually, I think what um, the UTLA president said until we actually calibrate. So is LBCC already calibrated to support Latino students or um, do, can we do that simultaneously? Because I'm concerned that programs like AMESA, like Puente, like EOPS, which, which have been at the forefront of these services, providing some access, now some will get abandoned because we do need to scale up, but how do we calibrate ourselves first? And well, can you talk to us about Long Beach City's, right. Long Beach City's well, success in that if you have that? First of all, there's, there's certainly, I'm not saying that we abandon EOPS or Puente, but we, we can't pat ourselves on the back because we have a Puente or EOPS program. I mean, that's just craziness. We're never going to get there as long as we continue to say that that's the model we have and that's all we're going to do. What we've learned from Puente, from EOPS, is we need to become more prescriptive with all of our students, every single one of our students. We need to uh, have expectations of our students. We need to give them the classes that they need up front and the services that they need up front. Can we scale up? We're, doing, we're trying to do that now. We are treating the entire cohort of Long Beach Unified High School students, which we get about 1,700 students a year, and we're going to treat them as one cohort. We're going to uh, front load their courses. We're going to require them to go through orientation. We're going to require them to take a student success course, and we're going to require them to take math and English in their first year. That will not be a choice. 
that will impact all the students, regardless of whether they're African American, uh, Latino, or whatever. But that's what we've learned from programs like EOPS and Puente. Uh, certainly there's a, a counseling aspect that we still need to continue to work on because there are not now, nor will there be in the future, enough counselors to scale up in, in the way that we do for EOPS. But we need to look at advising in a different format. We need to begin working in the high schools to begin building educational plans in their first year so that at least when they hit the door, they have a plan in place. Uh, so, um, so certainly here at Long Beach, no one's talking about abandoning. We're really talking about using the expertise and what we've learned in EOPS and begin to build scalable models and we're going to be implementing that with our cohort from Long Beach Unified First. Any other questions? Right in the back. Everything I heard, it's just so promising um, coming from Fresno, the rural areas. Um, just one quick question. Where is the parent component in this? I mean, yes, we can do a lot for our students, but first generation, and I'm sure maybe many of us in this room have been first generation. I know my parents didn't know anything about college. My dream was get married and I was going to get pregnant and then help, you know, Moses pick grapes, right? I was going to be the wife carrying the water. That was my dream. That was my dream. And it was only because a teacher saw more in me than that, that she came over to my house to get me going so that I'd be caught up with the rest of the students and my life's changed. I have three daughters at Fresno State and a son in Riverdale High School. Riverdale High School only offers rigorous um, college program, meaning you're either in college prep, AP, or honors. That's it. I was very blessed. And I see that there is a lot going on and, and sad, you know, for students. But where are the parents? What are we going to do about the parents to prepare them so that they can be a better asset in their children's education? So I see the plan and I see, yes, work with, you know, K through 12. It's, it's, it's great. I hope we can do that. How are you going to bring in the parents? Well, I mean, certainly the parents are a component. Um, when we say we work with a K-12, we work on parent education as well. Uh, that's why we bring every fourth grade student to Long Beach City College, and that's why we take every fifth grade student to Cal State University Long Beach. And then there are parent workshops along the way. But furthermore, you know, even beyond that, when they get to our door, what we want to do is to be able to build in that first year so that they are in courses that they are going to need no matter what pathway they're going to choose so that we front load it. I'm not saying that we will become the parent, but we will be more prescriptive in that first year. But I mean, you're absolutely right. We need to work with every organization to better educate parents because um, they're the first step in educating our children about how to get to college and succeed. And if I could really quickly, one of the things that we find at DeVry University in particular is the importance of going to our parents' community as opposed to expecting them to come to us. Um, you know, a, a lot of this has to do, especially in the Latino community, of, of establishing that comfort and the understanding of where people are at within their own communities. So going to those communities, talking to parents, if they're only Spanish-speaking parents, speaking to them in Spanish about the opportunities that our institutions avail to their students or to their children. I think we have a question over there. Sorry about the lot. Question. Well, I've also uh, worked within uh, the community and also some of the, the concerns that you've voiced parents and do realize that a lot of it is uh, a shared responsibility, as they spoke earlier, on the school, the student, and then also the, the community and parents. 
Uh, the question that I have, I guess, would be more for the, the community college sector because I know that it's uh, an amazing asset to students, especially those that may not be prepared to go directly to a four-year university or whether it be financial base or just maybe that's not the direction they want to go. But with the growing population in California and the class sizes and difficulty of gaining courses, do you foresee any difficulties with uh, the front-loading process that you mentioned? And if so, what type of things are in place, would you say, to, to address that? Well, the only obstacles to what I suggest is us. We schedule. We schedule our courses. Um, and I'm not saying that that's an easy obstacle to overcome, but it's a matter of priority in my mind. It's a matter of priority. What are we going to prioritize? Um, we need to prioritize the student schedule first and begin to work our schedule around that. And that takes a little bit of time, but I think once, um, once that becomes a priority, th then, then everything flows from that. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, finances are an issue, uh, but the reality is uh, our financial picture is not going to get any better, so you know, we need to put that excuse aside and deal with this group of students that we have now and figure out how we're going to apply the resources and prioritize them. Are there any other questions for our panel? Any? Oh, go ahead. Oh. I need to add that in many districts, class, classes are being cut. So it's really, really difficult now for students to access classes. So that's happening across the state, as you all know. So I don't know where it's going to end, but that scheduling has become a real issue for students. And some districts are looking at maybe offering maybe the auto program at one college. And students live in the extreme other side of the county, and they can't get to that auto program. So there are some decisions that are being made across the state that are going to really negatively impact students. I think we have one more one question out here in the back. But before we continue, I had a, a question for folks in the audience as well. You know, in, in Sacramento, every year is during the budget season, there's a fight to keep the academic preparation programs like EOP, EOPS, Puente, you name them. Now, a, a, a challenge we have as members of the legislature we know they work, trust me. The majority of the Latinos that are in the legislature all came through one of those programs. So the, the tough thing for us to fight back with is data. And how do we track the students that have gone through these programs that we know work and track their success rate so when we're dealing with the administration, we show them raw data of the success rates of these programs. And that's just open for everyone. Um, unfortunately, the Chancellor's Office has not done a really good job of, that, of, of getting that data. For EOPS, for example, they're, they're, they compare apples to oranges. So what we're going to have to do, because we've come across that where we're asked to present data, and some of the conservative legislators have said, well, you're not doing that well because data shows that you're not that successful. We know we are. So we're, as an EOPS association, a professional organization, we're going to have to get our own researches together to do our own research because it's not happening through the chancellor's office. Well, and I would add, um, I mean, certainly um, I, I agree that EOPS students are doing better in the, than the general population. But my, my, what I would say is it isn't a question of protecting the funding for those academic preparation programs, the question is holding colleges responsible for making sure all of their students are academically prepared and then tying the funding to that. I mean, we tie the funding for, for EOPS uh, and other categorical programs, but we need to hold our colleges responsible otherwise and accountable. Otherwise, we only have success in an EOPS program and we forget about the 90 something odd percent of the rest of the students. Adela Lopez, I'm at Fullerton College. I teach ethnic studies. And um, we some of the comments that were made are sort of really conflicting at really critical points now because I know that we need we have this mission, we have this goal, we have had those cutbacks. The majority of our students who do come to us 
across the board, regardless of their racial or ethnic background, are deficient in their academics. And as we're cutting back courses, the students are basically just enrolling in any course they can that's open in order for them to be able to qualify for their financial aid, right? Because, I mean, for many of them, that's the only way they are going to be there. So in effect, we're shooting ourselves in the head and the foot and everywhere else because the fact of the matter is that many of our students in coming to classes for which they have absolutely no preparation. And um, I, applaud, I, I applaud you here at Long Beach City for trying to do what you're doing. Again, you're doing it for, what did you say, 1,400 students, 1,700 students? But uh, when we're looking at thousands of students in terms of our student population, we're still looking at just the drop in the bucket. And when the state legislature is looking at us and saying to us, well, what can you do with what we give you? Well, I mean, this has been deficit that's been going on for decades. I mean, I've been at community college now for 38, 39 years. And it's always been that, you know, borrow now and pay later. But now it's really hit the fan so that we have no place else to go. So my concern is that all of these things obviously are coming at a point which is extremely critical. But on our campus, I know that we've been hearing uh, among some of the discussion the fact that students who would be needing to enroll in courses that go one grade level below, you know, freshman level in English, in math, for example, should be referred to School of Continuing Ed. Now, if that happens, that would mean none of our students, for the most part, would be eligible to apply for financial aid. Because even if they weren't deficient, let's say in math, but if they were deficient in English and had to go to School of Continuing Ed, when you're taking School of Continuing Ed courses, it doesn't make you eligible for financial aid. Well, I can't speak to what's happening in North Orange County and Community College District, and certainly there has been talk about cutting off apportionment for two levels, below two levels below, uh, and that is certainly a, a uh, controversial um, issue that I think needs a lot of discussion because you can't have the discussion, that discussion without talking about whether or not we're going to finance adult education in the state. Uh, but at some point, we need to be clear on what the legislature, what the state expects from community colleges. Are we expected to just keep the door open for everyone or are we expected to educate and prepare a workforce? And I'm not saying that those two are necessarily in conflict, but we need to begin to prioritize what we are going to deliver. And um, uh, so, you know, when we're talking about a cohort of 1,700 students, we plan to roll it out for all of our students. But we've got to begin in one place, and that's with our Long Beach Unified High School seniors. Um, but I can look at any campus of the 112, and I guarantee you there's a lot of courses that we're offering that we don't need to offer. We're gonna have um, one last question, I believe. Say, okay, great. Uh, well, thank you to our panelists. It's uh, been a pleasure serving as your moderator. Uh, I think you know the the lively discussion on all the sessions merits um, the understanding that we need to have further discussion about how we're gonna educate our future generation and our future leaders of the state. And and you know, Senator Mendoza and I and the Latino Caucus definitely take to heart the discussion and know that the legislature has to do their part in order to invest in our kids. And, and we know we continue to um, make you do more with, with less, and we understand. So I think it's time for us as legislators to really go up to Sacramento and, and have that frank discussion with our leadership about we want a, uh, an educated workforce, but yet we continue to cut and cut and cut. And so at some point, that no longer works. Also, just leave you with this, uh, there's a, a, a go ongoing discussion on the master plan for higher education and the need to start planning f you know, more, much more quickly in, fi in, in time, time frames of five to three years because technology has forced us. We can no longer create a master plan that's going to you know, talk about the next 50 years. We really got to work on the immediacy now and, and think of maybe in spurts of five years, given the technology that we have. So thank you. Uh, I appreciate the discussion and, and serving as your moderator. Gracias. Great. Well, uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Member Lada, summed it up very well. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today.
uh, and also the viewers that were on the web. Uh, I want to thank all of you for taking time to discuss this very important issue. This is actually, uh, we've done, the Latino Caucus have done education summit before. The last one was about four years. So we're very fortunate to do it now. It's very important to all of us, and uh, my colleagues are very appreciative of you being here and giving your comments and input and participation. So with that, with that, God bless each and every one of you, and stay in contact. Thank you so much.